be broadcasting live for the first time using StreamYard. I sure hope this works. I thought a worthy follow-up to my last video would be to go over the COVID-19 timeline, according to Rocco Galati, who is the lawyer in Toronto who is suing just about everybody. Uh, Justin Trudeau, Dr. Theresa Tam, Mark Garneau, Doug Ford, Christine Elliott, Stephen Lecce, D David Williams, who's a doctor, uh, John Tory, who is the mayor of Toronto, a few medical health officers, the Queen, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Here is what he has to say about the chronology of this disease. Now, there is, there are actually some things that predate the year 2000, where he starts his chronology, and they are in the movie Plandemic, because it talks about how coronavirus patents started to be taken out in the late 1990s. So, the timeline. In 2000, Bill Gates steps down as Microsoft's CEO and creates the Gates Foundation and, along with other partners, launches the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. The Gates Foundation has given Gavi approximately $4.1 billion. Gates has further lobbied other organizations such as the World Economic Forum and governments to donate to Gavi, including Canada and its current Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who has donated over $1 billion to Gates slash Gavi. In 2002, scientists engage in gain-of-functions research that seeks to generate viruses, quote, with properties that do not exist in nature, end quote, and to, quote, alter a pathogen to make it more transmissible to humans or deadly, end quote. In November 2002, scientists engage in, oh, ha, China's Guangdong province reports the first case of atypical pneumonia, later labeled as SARS. In the same month at the University of North Carolina, UNC, Ralph Barrick announced the creation of a synthetic clone of a mouse coronavirus. On October 28, 2003, the Barrick Group at UNC announces a synthetic recreation of the SARS virus. In 2005, research demonstrates that chloroquine is a potent inhibitor of SARS coronavirus infection and transmission. From 2009 to the present, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation donates millions to the Imperial College of London and further funded the debunked modeling by Neil Ferguson at the ICL that set the COVID-19 pandemic declaration in motion and acceleration through the World Health Organization and governments around the world following suit. In January 2010, Bill Gates pledges $10 billion in funding for the World Health Organization and governments around the world following suit. Okay, yes, and announces the decade of vaccines. In fact, Bill Gates and Gavi are the second and third largest funders of the WHO after the U.S. government. Currently, the USA, through its president, has cut off funding to WHO for loss of confidence in it. Various other countries have also expelled the WHO on allegations of corruption, attempted bribery of its officials, and lack of confidence. In May 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation writes a report later leaked, unintentionally, from within the organization with the study of a future pandemic scenario where an unknown virus escapes Wuhan, China, and a hypothetical scenario on what the appropriate response would be and its core scenario entitled How to Secure Global Governance in a Pandemic. The plaintiff state, and the fact is, that the scenario scripted in this May 2010 report is what has unfolded during the COVID-19 so-called pandemic. In 2011, a review of the literature by the British Columbia Centre for Disease Control to evaluate the effectiveness of social distancing measures such as school closures, travel restrictions, and restrictions on mass gatherings to address an influenza pandemic, concluded that such drastic restrictions are not economically feasible and are predicted to delay viral spread but not impact overall morbidity. In May of 2012, the 194 member states of the World Health Assembly endorsed the Global Vaccine Action Plan led by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in collaboration 
with Gavi and the World Health Organization. In 2014, under President Obama, the National Institute of Health halts federal funding for gain-of-function research. The funding hiatus applies to 21 studies reasonably anticipated to confer attributes to influenza, MERS, or SARS viruses, such that the virus would have enhanced pathogenicity and or transmissibility in mammals via the respiratory route. NIH later allows 10 of the studies to resume. In 2015, NIAD awards a five-year $3.7 million grant to conduct gain-of-function studies on the risk of bat coronavirus emergence. 10% of the award goes to Wuhan, China, Institute of Virology. In January 2015, at a public appearance, Bill Gates states, we are taking things that are genetically modified organisms and we are injecting them into the little kid's arms. We just shoot them right into the vein. In 2017, Dr. Mark Lipsitch of the Harvard School of Public Health tells the New York Times that the type of gain-of-function experiments endorsed by Dr. Fauci's NIAD have done almost nothing to improve our preparedness for pandemics and yet risk creating an accidental pandemic. Hmm. In 2019, NIAID awards a six-year renewal grant of $3.7 million to Echo Health Alliance and the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China to continue their gain of function studies on bat coronaviruses. At the 20 at the January 2019 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, on January 23rd, on a CNBC interview, Bill Gates boasts that he expects to have a 20-fold return on his $10 billion vaccine investment within the next few decades. 200 billion? That's not bad. British and French researchers published a study May 5, 2020, estimating that COVID-19 could have started as early as October 6, 2019. On October 18th through 27th, 2019, Wuhan, China hosts the Military World Games, held every four years, where more than 9,000 athletes from 100 countries compete. The telecom systems for the Athletes Village are powered with 5G technology, showcasing its infrastructure and technological prowess. On October 18, 2019, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and the John Hopkins Center for Health Security convene an invitation-only tabletop exercise called Event 201 to map out the response to a hypothetical global coronavirus pandemic. In November to December 2019, general practitioners in northern Italy start noticing a strange pneumonia. On December 2nd and 3rd, 2019, vaccine scientists attending the WHO's Global Vaccine Safety Summit confirm major problems with vaccine safety around the world. On December the 3rd, 2019, at Global Vaccine Safety Summit in Geneva, Switzerland, Professor Heidi Larson director of the Vaccine Safety Project stated, I think that one of our biggest challenges is, as Bob said this morning or yesterday, we're in a unique position in human history where we've shifted the human population to vaccine-induced, to dependency on vaccine-induced immunity, and that's on the great assumption that populations would cooperate. And for many years, people lined up these six vaccines. People were there. They saw the reason. We're in a very fragile state now. We have developed a world that is dependent on vaccinations. We don't have a choice but to make that effort. On December 18, 2019, researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, report the development of a novel way to record a patient's vaccination history by using smartphone-readable nanocrystals called quantum dots embedded in the skin using microneedles. In short, a vaccine chip embedded in the body. This work and research are funded by the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation. On December 31st, 2019, Chinese officials informed the WHO about a cluster of mysterious pneumonia cases. Later, the South China Morning Post reports it can trace the first case back to November 17th, 2019. On January 27, 2020, Chinese authorities formally identify a novel coronavirus. On January 11, China records its first death. And on January 20, the first U.S. case is reported in Washington state. On January 23, 2020, 
Xi Zhengli releases a paper reporting that the new coronavirus is 96% identical to the strain that her lab isolated from bats in 2013 but never publicized. On January 30th, the WHO declares the new coronavirus a global health emergency. In January 2020, a study of U.S. military personnel confirms that those who received an influenza vaccine had an increased susceptibility to coronavirus infection. On February 3rd, Bill and Melinda Gates announced $100 million in funding for coronavirus vaccine research and treatment efforts. On February 11th, the WHO gives the virus its name COVID-19. On February 28th, the WHO states that most people will have mild symptoms from SARS-CoV-2 infection and get better without needing any special care. Isn't that interesting? February 28th, most people get better without any hospitalizations, not anything. February 28th, the WHO announces that more than 20 vaccines are in development globally. <laughs> so the same day that it says most people get better, there are 20 vaccines in development. Uh, the same day, the WHO states, our greatest enemy right now is not the virus itself, it's fear, rumors, and stigma. March 5th, Dr. Peter Hotez of Baylor College told the U.S. Congressional Committee the coronavirus vaccines have always had a unique potential safety problem, a kind of paradoxical immune enhancement phenomenon. On March 11th, the WHO declares COVID-19 a pandemic. March 12th, Education Minister Stephen Lecce, Lecce uh, ordered the closing down of public schools on the advice of Dr. Williams, the co-defendant. On March 16th, 2020, Neil Ferguson of Imperial College London, scientific advisor to the UK government, publishes his computer simulations warning that there will be over 2 million COVID-19 deaths in the US unless the country adopts intensive and socially disruptive measures. Imperial College London receives funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. On March 16th, 2020, Dr. Anthony Fauci tells Americans that they must be prepared to take more drastic steps and hunker down significantly to slow the coronavirus's spread. On March 16, 2020, NIAID launches a phase one trial in 45 healthy adults of the mRNA 1273 coronavirus vaccine co-developed by them and Moderna. The trial skips the customary step of testing the vaccine in animal models prior to <laughs> proceeding to human trials. Let's go straight to the people. March 17th, Prime Minister Trudeau asked for lockdown measures under the Federal Quarantine Act banning travel. The same date, Premier Doug Ford declares an emergency in Ontario under its provincial legislation. The status of COVID-19 in the United Kingdom March 19th, is downgraded. COVID-19 is no longer considered a high consequence infectious disease. The Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens in the UK is also of the opinion that COVID-19 should no longer be classified as a high consequence infectious disease. Okay. On March 24th, 2020, Global medical experts declared that efforts to contain the virus through self-isolation measures would negatively impact population immunity, maintain a high proportion of susceptible individuals in the population, prolong the outbreak, putting more lives at risk, damage our economy, and the mental stability and health of the more vulnerable. March 24th, Professor Peter Gotch? <laughs> Gotchy? I'd normally think it was Getch, uh, but it's Gotch, issues a statement. The coronavirus mass panic is not justified. Could we call that a gotcha moment? On March 24th, Bill Gates announced funding for a company that will blanket Earth with $1 billion in video surveillance satellites. On March 26th, Microsoft announced it is acquiring a firm networks focused on 5G and edge computing. Okay. March 26th, same day, Dr. Fauci publishes an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine stating that the overall clinical consequences of COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to those of a severe in seasonal influenza with a case fatality rate of, fatality rate of perhaps 0.1%. Boy, we forget those things were even said if we ever knew them. March 30th, 2020, Dr. Michael J. Ryan, Executive Director of the Health Emergencies Program at the WHO, publicly stated during a press conference that 
And at the moment, in most parts of the world, due to lockdown, most of the transmission that's actually happening in many countries now is happening at the household or the family level. In some senses, transmission has been taken off the streets and pushed back into family units. Now we need to go and look in families to find those people who may be sick and remove them and isolate them in a safe and dignified manner. March 31st, Dr. Teresa Tam states that it is not clear that masks actually help prevent infections and may increase the risk for those wearing them. April 2nd, 2020, Bill Gates states that a coronavirus vaccine is the only thing that will allow us to return to normal. April 2020, a review of the scientific literature conducted by Dennis Rancourt, PhD, with regards to the use of masking concluded there is no scientific evidence to substantiate the effectiveness of masking of the general public to prevent infection and transmission. On April 6th, German epidemiologist Nut Witkowski releases a statement warning that artificially suppressing the virus among low-risk people, like school children, may increase the number of new infections as it keeps the virus circulating much longer than it normally would. Right, you flatten the curve, you make it longer. April 6, 2020, Dr. Fauci states, I hope we don't have so many people infected that we actually have herd immunity. What's wrong with herd immunity? On April 9, 2020, Canadian public health officials stated, in a best case scenario, Canada's total COVID-19 deaths can range from 11,000 to 22,000. And in the bad scenarios, death will go, deaths will go well over 300,000. As of May 21st, the total reported deaths from COVID-19 in Canada was 6,145. The number of deaths attributed to COVID-19 is in line with typical yearly seasonal respiratory illness deaths in Canada. However, the COVID death numbers are inflated based on the parameters dictated by the WHO to list a death as a COVID-19 death, namely anyone who has the COVID-19 at time of death regardless of whether another clear primary cause of death is evident apart from the simple presence of the COVID-19 virus. On April 10th, John Carpe, president of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms in Canada, has stated there is no reason to conclude that the government's response to the virus is deadlier, or that there is reason to conclude that the government's response to the virus is deadlier than the disease itself. We've certainly seen that since then. On April 15th, Bill Gates pledges another $150 billion to coronavirus vaccine development and other measures. He states there are 7 billion people on the planet. We are going to need to vaccinate nearly everyone. On April 18th, the U.S. News reports coronavirus tests are ineffective due to lab contamination at the EDC and the CDC's violation of its manufacturing standards. On April 24, 2020, the Ontario government took the extraordinary step to release a database to police with a list of everyone who has tested positive for COVID-19 in the province. On April 30th, Bill Gates writes that the world will be able to go back to the way things were when almost every person on the planet has been vaccinated against coronavirus. Gates also states that governments will need to expedite their usual drug approval processes in order to deliver the vaccine to over 7 billion people quickly. On May 5, 2020, Neil Ferguson resigns from the UK government's scientific advisory group for emergencies after flouting and breaking his own social distancing rules. On May 6, that anonymous software engineer, ex-Google, pronounces Neil Ferguson's COVID-19 computer model unusable for scientific purposes. In fact, Ferguson's COVID-19 model has been laughingstock and debacle. On May 11th, UK Chief Medical Officer Witte states that COVID-19 is harmless to the vast majority. On May 14th, Microsoft announced that it is acquiring UK-based MetaSwitch networks to expand its Azure 5G strategy. On May 19th, 2020, Health Canada approves human trials of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine without clear evidence the prior animal testing to identify the potential risk of pathogenic priming, immune enhancement, has been conducted. Hmm. Don't even know if it works, but move along. May 1st, 2020, four Canadian infectious disease experts, Neil Rao, Susan Richardson, Martha Fulford, and Dominic Mertz state, the virus is unlikely to disappear from Canada or the world anytime soon. 
and it is unlikely that zero infections can be achieved for COVID-19. By May 2020, over 6 million Canadians have applied for unemployment benefits and 7.8 million Canadians required emergency income support from the federal government because of economic shutdowns and closures dictated by COVID measures. By May 2020, estimates of the federal deficit resulting from their response to SARS-CoV-2 ranges up to $400 billion. This exceeds the Can Canada's national budget for a year. Dr. Theresa Tam, May 20th, Canada's chief medical officer, publicly advised the use of non-medical masks for the general public to provide an added layer of protection that could help prevent asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic COVID-19 patients from unknowingly infecting others. Dr. Tam's advice is not supported by scientific evidence. On May 21, 2020, a letter from Mark Lesishan, MD, Chief, Deputy Chief Medical Health Officer with Vancouver Coastal Health states, although children are often at increased risk for viral respiratory illnesses, that is not the case with COVID-19. Compared to adults, children are less likely to become infected with COVID-19, less likely to develop severe illness as a result of infection, and less likely to transmit the infection to others. Dr. Lesishan further states, non-medical masks are not needed or recommended. Personal protective equipment, such as medical masks and gloves, are not recommended in the school environment. May 22nd, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau told reporters that contact tracing needs to be ramped up across the country. Trudeau stated that he strongly recommends provinces use cell phone apps when they become available and that this use would likely be mandated. On or about May 25th, the federal government announced potential criminal code provisions, making it a criminal offense to publish misinformation about COVID-19. Misinformation quickly evolves to mean any opinion or statement, even from recognized experts, which contradicts or criticizes measures taken and or mandated by the World Health Organization to be implemented globally by national and regional governments. As of June 9, 2020, Neither Prime Minister Trudeau nor Premier Ford are willing and in fact refusing to disclose what medical advice and from whom they are acting upon. June 11, 2020, Toronto Mayor John Tory announces that mandatory face masks will be implemented on the Toronto Transit Commission's subways, buses and streetcars, notwithstanding that operations of the TTC continued as normal for the last four months since the dedicated outbreak and emergency without neither any face masks nor any realistic way of reinforcing the six feet social distancing rule on public transit. The plaintiff state, and the fact is, that face masks, it has been scientifically and medically established, do nothing to prevent the spread of airborne viruses and in fact cause other health problems. The plaintiff state, and the fact is, that the defendants and their officials are stepping up compulsory face masks in order to maintain a physical and visual tool to maintain panic, fear, and to enforce compliance of their baseless measures due to increasing public resistance and of their groundless and false basis. The masks further act as a visual and present symbol of intimidation and show of who is in power and do not act to medically assist but to publicly muzzle panic, instill fear, and exert compliance to irrational and ineffective COVID measures from the plaintiffs and others. The plaintiff state and the fact is that these measures were upstepped after a Canadian survey was released uh, was that revealed inter alia that 50% of Canadians did not believe Justin Trudeau was being honest about the COVID measures. 16% of the Canadians believe that the COVID measures are being used to affect mandatory vaccination and contract <laughs> contract tracing and other surveillance should be contact. 19% of the Canadians do not believe that COVID-19 is no more harmful than a common flu, and 7% of Canadians believe that COVID-19 does not exist at all and is being misused as a pretext for other ulterior motives. On or about June 11, 2020, Wellington Dufferin Guelph County in Toronto, through its public health officer, Dr. Nicola Mercer, announced and ordered that all customers and all employees of all businesses in the county would be required to wear face masks, including children under the age of five and special needs persons who cannot and will not countenance a face mask. On June 3rd, Federal Minister of Transport Mark Garneau announced that face masks were required by all when taking public transportation in Canada, whether by plane, train, ship, or transit. On June 11th, Toronto Mayor John Tory announced the coming compulsory wearing of face masks on the Toronto Transit Commission's vehicles and property. On June 18th, 2020, 
the County of Windsor, Essex in Ontario through its public health officer, Dr. Wajid Ahmed announced, ordered that all customers and all employees of all businesses in the county would be required to wear face masks. I think he's probably getting sued here too. Between April 1st and June 15th, 2020, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association reports that approximately 10,000 COVID-related charges were laid across Canada, 2,853 of them in Ontario. We can think about that family who, what, they were rollerblading in Whitby or Oshawa, and they all got fined like $850? Crazy. On June 11, sorry, 17, 2020, the Toronto Hospital for Six Children considered the world's premier children's hospital completed an advisory report publicly released days later to the Minister of Health and Education with respect to recommendations for the reopening of school in September 2020. The report was prepared by two experts in virology upon the contribution and review of another 20 experts as well as the Sick Kids Family Advisory Networks. The 11-page report is sound and clear on the facts. Uh, children are extremely low risk when it comes to COVID-19. Schools should reopen in a normal setting in September 2020 in Ontario. That No masks should be worn by children because of no evidence of effectiveness. And in fact, masks pose a health risk for children. Social distancing should not be employed. And that masks and social distancing pose significant physical and psychological health risks to children. On June 23rd, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms calls for, in a 69-page report, an end to the lockdown measures based on an analysis of the lack of medical and scientific evidence for the imposition and the infliction of unwarranted and severe charter violations. On June 26th, Sweden COVID-19 expert Anders Tegnell blasted the WHO's response to COVID-19 and states that the world went crazy and further stingingly criticized the WHO as misinterpreting data in branding Sweden as one of 11 countries who are seeing a resurgence in COVID-19 cases. The plaintiff states, and the fact is, that Sweden was one of the few countries in the world who did not adopt wholesale the WHO protocol, and in fact fared much better than countries who did, including Canada, in that there was no economic shutdown in Sweden. Dr. Tignell further stated that the lockdowns fly in the face of what is known about handling virus pandemics. On June 18th, Premier Doug Ford announced an upcoming upstep and acceleration of the implementation of contact tracing surveillance through cell phones. And on June 28th, 2020, the City of Toronto announces and put forward a mandatory mask bylaw for all indoor public venues, including private businesses. I've talked to Rocco Gulati and they have asked for more time to, uh, the, the people that are being sued have asked for more time to uh, deal with this. And uh, so we'll see how this goes forward. But some interesting things here when we look back on what was, has been said. And some of the people advocating one thing were advocating something much different not long ago. And it seems like the most restrictive things have been the opinions and the practices that have prevailed. Thanks for watching.